So let's get started. Um, first of all, how many of you have actually been out to the foundation? We're out in Sun Valley. OK, more of you need to go. We're a year-round native plant nursery and education center. We have demonstration gardens, all with the plants labeled, their height and width, how much water um, they, they need, what sorts of insects and animals they feed. Um, and then the nursery carries about between 400 and 600 plant species and subspecies from week to week. We have an inventory online, a native plant library online. So you can just get all the information that you need for um, making a plan for your garden. Now, uh, tomorrow is the second day of the Theodore Payne Foundation's Native Plant Garden Tour. Um, the day tomorrow is in the San Fernando and San Gabriel Valleys. So um, if you wanted to go on this tour, I would suggest from here driving to Pasadena, it's about one hour, and at 812 East Mountain Avenue in Pasadena, that is one of the homes on the garden tour where you can buy one of these guides to the 22 or so um, gardens that will be open on the tour tomorrow. Um, you can choose based on you know your sun exposure, your soil, if you have slopes, whatever, and just choose those gardens that actually fit the challenges that you have in your space at home. OK. All right, welcome, folks. Please take a seat. OK, so California native plants for riverside gardens and why native plants matter. Okay, I'm going to see how much you know. Is this the California native landscape? Yes or no? No. Excellent. What about this? No. All right, this is what is typically promoted as a California-friendly garden. The problem is, is that even though it uses less water than, say, a tropical garden, it annihilates the ecosystem in that little patch of space. So what you're going to learn this morning is all about the whys and wherefores of gardening with native plants in the Riverside area. All right, this is native. We have coral bells, bush anemone, um, ground cover lilac. The yellow of the Fremontodendron is amazing, and that plant takes no summer water once established. And these are houses that are on the tour tomorrow, by the way. Um, this is native. This is in Northridge, gets extremely hot, and you can see that they've got native sage, um, yarrow. This is garden number 40. This is 812 East Mountain Avenue in Pasadena. This is on the tour. He has a lot of species that are found in the riverside and desert areas. Here's another one in Valley Glen. This front yard used to be just flat lawn. Very unremarkable looking. You know, um, it may be about 25 feet wide and about, about 25 feet deep. And this is what they did with it. So when you come out the front door, this is what you see. You have a seating area, you have a berm, and you have plants that bloom at different times of year. So to get California native plants by zip code, go to calscape.org. This is an excellent website. Type in your zip code, and it'll give you the plants, tree, the trees, shrubs, vines, ground covers, wildflowers that were once found in your zip code. And those are going to be the best adapted to your site and support the insects and the animals the best. Then on the calscape.org website, you can find really good instructions about watering about why the, and about why planting this plant is important and companion plants that it's often found with. All right, so in Riverside, you've got 607 plants that are native to this zip code, 92502. Um, go there. It has a wealth of information. So 
in a nutshell, the reason why we need to do native plant landscaping across the United States is because 55% of our land use is for urban and suburban uses. 41% is for agriculture, and only 4% of our wild lands are left. What we do in this 55% matters for water use, for decreasing use of pesticides, for protecting our watershed, for not stealing water from distant river ecosystems, and for supporting the nature of where we live. We need to help nature because she's struggling because of our actions. So that 55% could be wildlife habitat if we landscape native. Most of the photos you're going to see in this presentation were uh, of insects and animals were taken in my yard. I used to have, when I moved into my house, lawn, roses, man mandevilla vine. And the, all these butterflies, native bees, birds, they all came in once I planted what they need. So there's a question, is there a sixth mass extinction in the making? The world has lost 52% of its vertebrate wild animals in the last 50 years. We know that our pollinators are doing a nosedive, both the honeybees and the native bees and other types of insects that are pollinators. Um, Two-thirds of the American bird species are at moderate to high risk of extinction. So there's not a lot of good news out there about what's happening to the natural world but there's something we can do right at home that helps and is positive and it works. The extinction rate is a thousand times the normal background rate. And we have increased drought and increased um, heat that starts earlier and lasts longer. So we need to create sustainable, resilient communities where we live. And we do that through landscaping native. Now, we can do native plants in containers. You don't have to have a yard. We can do native plants in parkways and mixed with non-native plants. You don't have to rip out your ma mature trees or everything that you have and put in only natives. You can mix native plants with other plants that have the same sunlight, water, and soil requirements. This is a yard with bottle brush and Mediterranean olive and Spanish lavender. It has um, native buckwheat, lilac, um, a bladder pod, and different kinds um, of manzanita. So you can mix things if they're all compatible. Now, why native? This is the thing that people always say to me at outreach events is, oh, I already plant drought tolerant. Do you all know that there's a difference between Mediterranean non-native and natives? Yes or no? OK. So for the people that aren't sure, in a nutshell, the difference between a native and a non-native plant is that the native plants have evolved in that place for thousands to millions of years, co-evolving with the insects, the animals, the soil, the weather, the amount of water that's available. And so there are other Mediterranean parts of the world, like where we live, there's the Mediterranean in Europe. There's the west um, coast of South America, west coast of Australia, and the tip of Africa. So all those places have a Mediterranean type of climate like we do. But if we import those plants here, they'll grow here just fine, but they're not going to support the ecosystem because they don't support the specialized co-evolutionary relationships that make the nature of each place. So let's look at what native is. It's adapted to rainfall. Um, this is Death Valley after um, a couple inches of, of rain, wildflowers. Native plants are adapted to survive on rainfall wherever they live. And in California, once you get your plants established, um, your native garden, if, unless you plant riparian plants, can look terrific on water every three to four weeks once the plants are established. Now natives, they're adapted to soil. You do not need to add soil amendments or fertilizers. 
the biggest thing I hear people say about their soil is, oh, I have terrible soil. No, you don't have terrible soil. It's that you're planting the wrong plants in that soil. For California natives, the soil is perfect. It's what they've been evolving in for millions of, of years. And the reason why not adding fertilizers and soil amendments is so important is that when you add soil amendments, the roots tend to go round and round in that one place and just stay in that little hole, and they don't extend and make a good deep root system. Then the other reason why you don't want to add soil amendments is that oftentimes they can make your plant grow way too fast and not get a good root structure down below. It's like putting your plant on speed. Um, fertilizers, same thing. Then when you fertilize, oftentimes that fertilizer will run off and go into um, the runoff that heads toward the ocean, and then we get algae blooms out in our oceans and that kill the fish. So everything has a consequence, and if you garden with natives, you're doing a world of good, both for what's right on your property and for distant ecosystems and ocean health. All right, now natives are also adapted to climate. Here's a great example of how a turtleback plant has gray leaves, they're fuzzy, and then um, that reflects the, the light. The plant does not absorb as much heat. And then um, the shape of the plant is a dome. That means that when the plant transpires, the, the dome with interlocking leaves will catch any water that the plant loses. And then when the plant breathes back in, it recoups that water. This is a brilliant uh, shape for a plant in a very hot climate. OK, so natives, they're adapted to wildlife. Um, they lure in wildlife by giving them the flower shape and colors that the wildlife would like. Then wildlife is also ad adapted to the native plant. So for instance, here's a spring azure type of butterfly. Its caterpillars can only eat the leaves of our native lilac fruit, sorry, eat the young fruit of our native lilac and the leaves of dogwood. So if those plants were to not be here anymore, that butterfly would probably not be able to adapt in time and would go extinct. So native plants, insects, and animals have co-evolved. Here's um, a California sister type of butterfly. Its caterpillar can only eat the leaves of native oaks. Now the science of co-evolution is that as the California landscape evolved and changed, the plants and animals co-evolved with it. And so if you look at the facts about what insects that le eat leaves can eat, it's that 90% of leaf-eating insect species can eat only, only native plants. They only have the stomach enzymes to digest certain kinds of things because that's what they have evolved with. That's their ecological niche. Oftentimes, I'll hear people say, oh, I love butterflies, but I can't stand caterpillars, and I'll plant a butterfly garden. <laughs> okay, there's, okay, I'm glad to hear laughter. <laughs> and people will plant a butterfly garden only with the nectar plants, none of the caterpillar leaf forage plants. Is that going to work? No. So plant for the complete cycle. And the best way that you can do that, or one of the best ways, is to get this book, An Introduction to the Butterflies of Southern California, by Fred Heath, H-E-A-T-H. Um, there are about 150 different kinds of butterflies in the southern half of our state. This book has 89 of them listed. It tells you the caterpillar forage and the nectar plant. So very, very important book. And basically, if you plant for butterflies and caterpillars, the rest is going to take care of itself. You know, you don't need to worry about the birds as, as much. 
or everything else, because when you plant a complete life cycle butterfly garden, everything else follows. All right, so once again, coevolution yields native plant insect relationships that are specialized. Here's the pale swallowtail. Ceanothus, holly leaf cherry, coffee berry, and red berry are the only caterpillar forage foods for this butterfly. And they're all gorgeous plants. So native plants are the foundation of the food web because they feed the insects that can convert leaf matter to protein and fuel the food web. So for instance, most caterpillars can eat only native plants. This is a picture of a towhee that was in the fuchsia behind it. And I didn't see the towhee at first. I just saw the plant sort of shaking. So I ran in and I got my camera. I came out, I stood there, and up popped this towhee with all of these caterpillars in its beak. <laughs> then it flew about 15 feet to its nest on under a big buckwheat. So this is what happens when you plant a native garden. The insects find it, and then the birds come in because the insects, particularly the caterpillars, are what the baby birds need to become adults. Let me ask you, how many caterpillars do you think it takes to feed one nest of four baby birds from the time they hatch until the time they fledge 17 days later? Okay, what, what about this side? What do you think? 500. 500, okay. Anybody else? 100. Okay, what about this side? 2,000. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Depending on the size of bird, if it's a tiny bird, about 1,000. If it's a slightly larger bird, about 3,000. So imagine you have 17 days to find 3,000 caterpillars. That's a lot of trips back and forth from the nest. Now when you think that birds generally only forage about 150 feet from their nest, because if they forage further, they're leaving their nest vulnerable to attack from crows and other animals. So when you have a native garden, and you, and you have shrubs that provide nesting areas, and then plants that provide the caterpillars, you are going to support your local birds and the migrating ones that come in. All right, so native plants, they make 35 times more caterpillars than non-natives. Now usually when I give this statistic, people that aren't um, accustomed to thinking in this way about gardens, they're horrified. They think, 35 times more caterpillars, I'm going to have a garden that is eaten down to nothing. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. What's happened is that the plants, because they've co-evolved with the insects, plants have all kinds of ways to try to outwit the insects, and it ends up being a standoff, usually. So, um, for instance, plants have fuzz on the surfaces of their leaves, and, or they have um, aromatic oils. A lot of um, the sages um, are very tough for most in insects to eat because a sage is really bitter if you bite into it. For a human, imagine what it's like for a bug. Or um, the plants have little um, spikes, like oaks, around the edges of their leaves. That means that the caterpillars can only get in into other parts of the margin. So it's a, it basically ends up being a standoff with the plants evolving and the insects evolving. But what happens is that it all works together. Doug Tallamy, um, who is the author of one of the most important books on landscaping with native plants, sent his graduate students out into the field. And he had them measure um, the amount of leaves that were, quote, damaged, unquote, by insects, the plants that were native. And it turned out to be one in 10 leaves. And that was just a hole or a corner or a little piece of the leaf taken. So 
if you go up with a micro, with a um, mag magnifying glass, you're going to see some damage. But if you stand back five feet, the plant looks great. So reverse your thinking. Welcome those holes in the leaves because that means that you have life in your garden. If you go to any non-native landscape around and you look at it, those non-native gardens will be green, they'll have flowers, but if you look at the birds and the butterflies are there, there are very few, if any. And if you look at the number of holes in leaves that are there, there are few, if any. And that's because the bugs literally cannot eat them. And without bugs, there's protein that is not going into the food web, and the food web crashes. So you need the natives. You need it for support of the ecosystem and for the very essence of the ecosystem. This is why native plants matter. Any questions? All right. So we know insects are essential. They're pollinators. They're food for other insects and animals. They're decomposers of organic waste. People love to hate yellow jackets. But yellow jackets are scavengers, and they clean up uh, decomposing animal matter. So we need yellow jackets. We need everything. And insects are population regulators of other or organisms. So insects do all sorts of things. If we didn't have ants, as E.O. Wilson said, we'd be up to our eyeballs in about six months with rotting putrid matter. Ants are that important. So most land animals need insects in some way for sur survival. They're either food or the insects make something um, for the that the animal leave needs at some stage of its life. All right, so that was the biodiversity part. Now for the water, California native plants use only about one-seventh the water of most non-natives. And that's again because they've evolved in this landscape. They know how to deal with drought because they've evolved in drought. They don't need fertilizer, soil amendments, or pesticides. So in California, 37 of the last 40 centuries were dry. And in the last 100 years, that was one of those three wet centuries. And that's when most of the population growth of our state happened. The problem is, is that people came in from other places. They wanted to plant what they knew from where they lived. And they looked at this um, relatively large, anomalous amount of rain we were having. And they thought, hey, subtropicals will work here just fine. And so we landscaped in a way that was not smart if we had known the history of our region. Drought is normal. Having wet years, that's the anomaly. And if we want to create sustainable, resilient, healthy watersheds, we plant native. All right, so households use, in Los Angeles at least, from 50 to 70% of their water on landscaping. And that's not native landscaping. 20% of California's energy use goes for making water um, safe to drink and pumping it from place to place. So, and then once we get all that water down here, we're spending it on plants that don't feed people and don't feed wildlife. This is insane, given the environmental challenges that we face. Use your water for plants that either feed people or feed wildlife. If it's just sitting there sucking up water, think twice. All right, so let's now get into some plants that are native to the Riverside area and some ways to co combine them. All right, so here's a home with a Chilean mesquite, but we have our own native mesquite, that I wanted you to see because of the way that the plants have been spaced. The biggest mistake that people make when they plant a native garden is they crowd the plants. 
and they don't plant for the plants with at maturity. So notice how every plant has about a, at least a foot of space between it and the plants around it. That way you can see their beautiful form and it doesn't look like this tangled mess. Then they've put hardscaping and low walls to kind of lead the eye to the front door. They've made a seating area and they've put in some boulders. So notice just the architectural uh, way that they've planned it. They've put a larger thing in front of a blank wall and then kept other things low for balance. Okay, here's another one. Um, again, the plants are spaced. It doesn't look crowded, but it looks lush. That's the kind of look that you want to go for. All right, so you use the natural structure. Here's one of the plants that's native to the Riverside area. Beautiful, beautiful tree, incredibly important for wildlife. And the leaves in spring are this bright, almost neon green. It's gorgeous. So that was natural structure. Then use built structure. And for instance, here is an apricot mallow. Gorgeous plant. Um, this is found all over the eastern Mojave and here. Um, there are entire hillsides of this mallow. It's breathtakingly beautiful and great for the native bees and other pollinators. Then you should contrast plant shape um, and the habit. So here we have um, a type of yucca and then one of our types of, of, of ferrocacti. So notice how you've got the rounded, the sort of um, uh, yin and yang of plants. One is more prostrate and one is more upright. Things are balanced. Then you also want to contrast the color of the leaves. So here's mesquite with the with the late afternoon sun on it. And then on the left is a, a desert type of um, atroplex. That's a salt bush, desert holly. So contrast for color. And think about when the plants are in leaf, when they're going to come into bloom, and play things off of one another, because that's the wonderful surprise that you can have with native gardens. All right, so this is the mesquite up on top, and then the holly um, on the bottom right. I mean, look at that. It's beautiful. And then the holly, when um, it's in berry, has these deep red berries all over it. It's gorgeous. Now, when I was taking um, these photos, I noticed that there was a damselfly on the holly. And I thought, damselfly on holly? What is it doing? It was eating the holly flowers. Everything I have ever read about damselflies is that they prey on other in insects. They're insect eaters. And yet here was this damselfly eating the flower and sucking the moisture out of it. So you support things in ways you might not even know about when you have a native garden. And you see these beautiful things that you'd otherwise probably never see if you had anything other than a native garden. All right. Um, all right, so then we have Ndutal's scrub oak. This um, is an oak that's native to this area. Oaks support over 5,000 beneficial insects and animals. Oaks are foundations of ecosystems. Um, this is one of the, the smaller oaks, and we have oaks that get up to 50 by 50. So choose the one that's right for your space. Um, have, has anyone ever seen an oak gall? Okay, so when you see these on your plant, don't be concerned. Um, what this is, is that there are little tiny sort of pinhead-sized wasps um, that will um, lay an egg un under the bark of the um, oak, and then the oak puffs up around it, and then the little tiny pinhead-sized, and I say wasps in, in quotes, because they're not or nothing that'll harm humans or sting them. Then the oak puffs up around it. The little tiny insects, they incubate in the gall, and then they eat their way out. 
That's all bird food. That's all lizard food. Don't worry. It's, it's just a co-evolutionary relationship. The galls do not hurt the plant. All right, then you've got um, a desert or palmer's oak. This one is right here in your local mountains. It's 13,000 years old. It's a Pleistocene relict from when the climate was uh, much uh, wetter and we had more rain and it was cooler on average. So this is one of, um, one of the relict plants from long ago. So we need oaks. Oaks provide all kinds of insect protein for, um, for other insects and animals. And then their acorns are food for birds and other animals. Band-tailed pigeons, for instance, half of their diet is acorns. And then the other half are the insects that live on native plants. OK, honey mesquite, gorgeous plant. Um, this gets large. It gets about, about 20 by 20. You can prune it up. Um, you can prune up the large shrub into a small tree. Makes these beautiful catkins of blossoms that are loved by the native bees and other types of pollinators. And then when the um, catkin is pollinated, it makes these bean pods. Now because it's in the Fabaceae family, it's a nitrogen fixer, so it will help fix nitrogen in your soil. Blue elderberry. This is one of my most favorite trees. Um, it, along with Toyon, are two of the most important plants in California for berry-eating birds. Blue elderberry um, is a tree that gets about 25 feet tall and 25 feet wide. It loses its leaves in November-ish, and then um, leaves out again around February. Um, then it makes these giant platter-sized clusters of blossoms that are loved by pollinators. And then when those clusters are pollinated, it makes berries for birds and people. This, yeah. Um, I think the Mexicana is, was renamed this because it was con confusing people and, it's, and they knew it was really a subspecies. So the, yeah, so this is it. Yeah. All right, so here's a band-tailed pigeon. In, in the morning, and this is in my backyard, in, in the mornings in the summer, I wake up and I can hear that the tree is full of birds just by the different wing beats. I can hear the band-tailed pigeons with their big wing spread making deep kind of sounds in the air, and the smaller birds, higher pitched sounds. The, the tree just vibrates with life, all spring for the pollinators, and then the birds and other animals in the summer and early fall. Here's a picture of the elderberry in my backyard. It's on the top right. You can see the crown. If you train it into a multi-trunk small tree, you will have a much more full canopy. Um, the tree is shading a creeping red fescue bunch grass, no mow lawn. Um, it's a beautiful grass. It takes about half the water of con conventional turf. And it feels good on bare feet. Creeping red fescue. If you plant that, it needs afternoon shade in an, an inland area. So anything from Pasadena east, you're going to need, it's going to need filtered light or, or afternoon shade. Yes, so all around this, and toward the end of the presentation, I'm going to have a lot of in, information about tips for, for gardening and mulch and irrigation and all of that. But that is mulch everywhere except in the conventional edible um, garden in, inside the ring of rocks about three to four inches deep. OK, so Toyon. Toyon is incredibly Im important. Um, it is a shrub that can be anywhere from 15 to 25 feet tall and wide. You can leave it as a giant shrub, or you can prune up the canopy to start at six feet and make a, a multi-trunk tree out of it. I had never seen a cedar waxwing until I had two toyons in my backyard. 
I was taking the kids to school, and we heard this cacophony of song in our backyard. And so we said, oh, I'll, I said, oh, I'll just write you a late note to my daughters. <laughs> so we went into the backyard, and there were 200 cedar wax wings feeding on the toyon. It was amazing. I had never seen so many birds together other than pigeons and seagulls. To see something else that was gorgeous just feeding and chattering along. And what was so cute was my daughters were young, and they noticed that there were about 200 wax wings sitting in the elderberry that was leafless. And then the birds took turns flying in groups of 50 to the toy on. So she said, look, mommy, they're taking turns. <laughs> so anyway, it was marvelous. The kids stayed home from school. They took about 400 pictures. This is one of them. And um, you know, that's the kind of magic that happens when you plant the plants that have the food and the shelter that the birds need. OK, sugar sumac. This is an amazing plant. Um, evergreen, incredibly tough. It makes these beautiful clusters of um, pink buds that then bloom into small pinkish white flowers. Incredibly resilient. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous plant for an informal hedge if you have a wide area. I've even seen these trained up into trees that are as tall as 35 feet. That those trees are now about 30 years old, but they're beautiful. OK, Yerba Santa. This is another native to, to the Riverside area. This is a gorgeous plant, clusters of lavender flowers. This gets about 10 by 10, and there are smaller um, types in this family. Um, once this plant is established, it takes no summer water. You will kill it. It has evolved to be fair, very finicky about not getting water in the summer, because that's what it's used to. OK, Nevin's barberry. This is one of my most favorite plants. Um, it's endangered in, in the wild. Uh, housing tracts have just mowed down all the, most of the places where the Nevin's barberry was once found. Um, and it's too bad, because it is a wonderful plant for a variety of reasons. It's excellent for food and shelter and for wildlife, and then also as a planting to keep people from making graffiti on a wall or climbing a wall. OK, this is what the plant looks like in the spring. Um, this plant gets about 8 to 10 feet tall and wide at maturity. And then it's loved by hummingbirds. Absolutely loved by hummingbirds. And then it's also a great nesting plant because the leaves of this barberry are quite thorny. So um, it's a great plant for birds to nest in because cats, for instance, cannot climb up into the plant to attack the nest. It's just too tough. So um, one word of caution. Do not plant this plant right next to a highly trafficked walkway. You want to plant it where there's no danger of people accidentally running into it or, or falling. Um, you know, it's not as bad as cactus, for instance, but it is a scratchy plant. That's the best way to think of it. Mm -hmm. The only one I would not plant if you um, have a two-year-old that likes sticking things in their mouth, or if you have a dopey teenager that wants to smoke anything they find, do not plant jimson weed. That's a dat datura. It's a neurotoxin. So there's a reason why the Native Americans use the plant for their initiation ceremonies to get their spirit animals. It's because if you smoke a very small amount of it, it does induce hallucinations. But if you smoke a little too much of it, which is very easy to do, you die. 
So do not plant this plant if you have dopey teenagers or two, two year olds. I have it in my backyard because I've got neither of those now. <laughs> and I have dogs, but the dogs are not in, interested in, in eating the leaves. And the, the datura is very important for many um, types of sphinx moth larva. And so it's a, it's a great deterrent to plant around tomato plants, for instance, because they're all in the nightshade family. And so the, the datura will draw in the sphinx moths for laying their eggs, and then your tomato plants are left alone. Or if the sphinx moths do lay their eggs on the tomato plant, then you just gently lift off the big, fat, juicy green caterpillar and put it onto the dat datura. Because that's, that's what it would be eating if we hadn't planted European, I mean South American tomatoes. OK. So this is what the Nevins barberry looks like in berry. Um, everything I'm showing you, like the elderberries, uh, the barberries, the currants that you'll see, it's great for people, great for wildlife. Um, this plant is just highly um, at attractive to birds when it's in, in berry. It's a wonderful plant. Matillaha poppies. These are a terrific plant, especially if you have a slope and you need erosion control. This uh, poppy gets about six feet tall. It makes blossoms for about uh, two to three months. And what you do with it for maintenance is every fall after its first year, you would cut it down to about two to six inches tall. Just cut it all down, two to six inches tall from the ground. And then it pops up with um, new stalks in the, in the spring, and you'll get a heavier bloom. If you weren't pruning it, it just turns into a giant bush with a very woody base. Um, if you whack it back, that keeps it coming up fresh and lovely and with more flowers, which you then get more seeds for birds. How often do you have to cut back? Just once a year around late November, once all the seeds are gone from the seed heads. Don't plant it in a small space. If it's next to some place, you don't want it to go. This plant is on, our, on the Theodore Payne Foundation's erosion control list for a reason. It spreads by underground runners and will go toward areas that have water. So you know, if you have a very small plot of land uh, for planting, I wouldn't do this, no matter how gorgeous it is. What if there's no water on the slope? Uh, it's, so you're basically saying, how do you establish a plant if there's no water? How do you establish that poppy if there's no water on the slope? OK, I'll get to establishment later on in the, in the class. And I will keep that question in your mind just to prompt me. But I'm, I'll, I'll address all of that. OK, so here's, for instance, what the Matillaha poppy looks like against a fence. So those poppies are facing east. All right, so then you should also use black and white sages. These are native to the Riverside area. All types of black sage uh, ground covers. And then white sage is gorgeous for its architectural shape. Here's a photo of a sparrow uh, perched on, the, on a um, wand from the white sage. Those were formerly white flowers that were pollinated by hummingbirds and other insects. And then the seeds are much loved by all kinds of seed-eating birds. Okay, buckwheat, incredibly important. There are many types of buckwheat. Um, this is one, a, a Dana Point species. Um, you can see the, the basic shape of the buckwheat flower, which is pom-poms of many smaller flowers. All of those little pom-poms become seed heads. Now, caterpillars of the square spotted blue um, eat the buckwheat leaves. Buckwheat is incredibly important because it feeds about seven different species of butterflies, caterpillars. So buckwheat is a super eco plant, both for the insects that it supports and then the seeds for birds that it then makes. Here's a sparrow eating buckwheat blossoms, and seeds from the flowers. 
here is in Indian mallow. Um, beautiful, beautiful plant. This gets about four feet by four feet. It's evergreen and it blooms nearly year round. It makes um, sort of yellow, orange, golden flowers that are pollinated by, for instance, this is a male valley carpenter bee. And when the flowers are pollinated, they make these beautiful little crowns of seeds for birds. And just to get back to tell you a neat fact about um, bees, researchers have discovered that bumblebees have the ability to distinguish human faces. So they're not just dumb in insects. If you're nice to it, it will remember. And it's, it's very interesting. I was uh, rushing out in, into my backyard one day and I accidentally swatted a wand of white sage that one of these male valley carpenter bees was feeding on. And all of a sudden, there is this bee right in front of me with these beautiful green eyes. And it's just, you know, three feet in front of me, staring at me like, well, what was that for? You know? And so I just, I, I looked at it, and it was the most amazing feeling being regarded by this insect and studied by this in insect. And I just looked at it, and I, I had actually been on my way out to take the trash out. And I just kind of took my trash, and I turned around and walked back into the house. And it, it was amazing, because then following the next couple days, I would see the bee out in the garden, and it would kind of look at me and then go back to feeding. It was like, do I have to worry about you? No, it's OK. So I mean, they're marvelous, marvelous animals that you don't need to worry about. They're gentle creatures. They're solitary bees. They don't have a hive to protect and defend like a European honeybee. They just want to pollinate and impregnate females, or if they're a female, lay, lay their eggs. That's all they want to do. And we can help them. Yeah. Yes, the female uh, valley carpenter bees are black with sort of bronze colored wings. And they're also very gentle. All right, so here's an Indian mallow in a yard with some California poppy. Beautiful, beautiful plant. This is a great plant to give as presents to people that are afraid of natives because it's just impossible not to love this plant. All right, the next plant is threadleaf ragwort. Um, this is an early, an, an early blooming plant, and it's important for all kinds of pollinators that come out in the um, early spring. Ima OK, I know this has weeds behind it in the picture, but if you just look at that, you can see how you can sort of put it next to a rock, and it would be beautiful. And it's also important because chuckwallas um, prefer yellow flowers. So when you think of designing a garden, don't just think about the birds and the butterflies. Think about you know, what kinds of um, food other animals might like. So chuckwallas like yellow flowers as the primary part of their diet, and then they supplement their diet with insects. OK, Mirabilis. This is a wonderful plant, and there are um, a couple types. Um, this is the pink flowering kind. It stays low and spreads wide. Um, my favorite Mirabilis is the Mirabilis um, latus viosa. And it is a white flowering um, type of, of California 4 o'clock. But it blooms nearly year round, and it's an late afternoon to early evening flowering plant. That's hence the name, just like this one. And so it supports a lot of the nighttime types of pollinators. So the bees, for instance, that can fly at lower light levels or in cooler air. And then it supports all the night flying insects, like sphinx moths and other moths. So these are marvelous, marvelous plants. Um, let me just get to the end of this section, and then we'll have a short break, and then we'll start in on irrigation and all sorts of other things. All right, then bladder pod, beautiful plant, four, four by four, evergreen, grows from the desert. 
over to the coast and um, can bloom yearly near round. Then our golden currant, this is a plant that will lose its leaves in the summer. That is its heat stress adaptation. So this is a beautiful plant to put, to pop up behind something that's evergreen. Um, I know people that have made the mistake of putting it front and center in their garden in a large patch, and their neighbors were horrified because this front and center portion of their garden all lost its leaves in the summer. So think about the time when the plant is in flower, and if you have something front and center, it's usually better to make it evergreen. Okay, these are the golden currants. This is, this is one of my children's favorite plants. In the uh, mornings, in the spring, they'd rush out before school and look to see if there were any currants for them to eat. Okay, Hooker's Evening Primrose, beautiful plant. This can be quite invasive, even though it's so gorgeous. It spreads by seeds, makes copious amounts of seeds. If you want great presents for the holidays, plant a Hooker's Evening Primrose, dig up the babies, and give them away. Um, it's gorgeous, it's quite drought tolerant, and it feeds things like sphinx moths. And then when the flowers are pollinated, um, like is shown here, the pollinated flowers make seed husks for birds. Here's a goldfinch eating seeds of Hooker's Evening Primrose. In my Hooker's Evening Primrose patch, there are usually about a dozen goldfinches all just delving into the old um, uh, flower husks for seeds. Here's our native fuchsia. We have many different kinds. This is an incredibly important plant for hummingbirds in the fall, uh, for the hummingbirds that migrate and the ones that stay here. It's a plant that once it's established, after the first year, you would cut it down to about an inch high. Um, and you want to grow it in amongst other plants that are evergreen. So for instance, here it is in a planter. It pops up in um, the spring, is leafy green, and then in the summer from about July through November, masses of orange flowers. Then I cut it back to about one inch from the ground, and um, underneath it is Pacific Mist Manzanita ground cover that is spilling out over the brick planter, and that is evergreen. So you can really play with mixing the plants that are evergreen for your anchor plants, and then the plants that will pop up at different times of year and give color. Here's matchweed, beautiful plant, um, very lacy looking and delicate, small. And lacy physelia, one of our many types of wildflowers. Wildflowers are incredibly important because our native bees are, um, we have about 1,400 known species of native bees in the state. And those bees have co-evolved to forage for nectar at the same time that their wildflower preferred type is in bloom. So when you plant the types of wildflowers that are native to your region, you're going to be helping the different species of native bees. Because imagine they come out of the ground or out of their um, tunnels in um, branches, and they look, and they're looking for the flowers that they evolved with. 80% of native flowers are visited by the native types of pollinators in that region. Only 8% of non-native flowers are visited by the native types of pollinators. So they don't recognize the non-native flowers as food. And the non-native flowers often don't have the kinds of mixes of protein and sugars in the nectar that the bees need because of co-evolution. Then there's Fremont's monkey flower. And then lastly, think about um, you know, the different seasons in your garden. People are always complaining about how California has no seasons. Well, if you don't plant natives, you won't see seasons. But if you plant natives, you will. So here, for instance, is our native saltgrass to this region. It will green out in the spring. And then here's yerba, yerba mansa, um, which will become you know, leafy green, um, big 
green leaves at the base and then um, white flowers in the spring and summer. So this is a winter landscape and then in the summer it's totally green with white flowers. So you can really, you know, play with the seasons through what you plant in your landscape. Here, for instance, and, and these last two pictures were taken over at Ash Meadow um, National Wildlife Refuge. It's part of Death Valley, and it's gorgeous. It's amazing. So here's um, two other types of plants that are native to the Riverside area. Um, velvet ash and alkali, alkali sacaton grass. Um, once again, you can see the, the upright um, form of the grass. Then there's yerba mansa on the bottom right of the picture. And then the ash, which have these sort of for, forlorn um, branching habits, those just become uh, green and, you know, just leafy green in the, in the spring and summer. So everything just transforms, and you see the seasons with natives. All right, so we'll take a quick break here, uh, just a five minute break, and then we'll come back and talk about irrigation, uh, establishment, spacing, all those good things. All right, so let's get started now with more ways to support wildlife and um, along with a lot of gardening tips for native gardens. So make a butterfly puddling dish. <laughs> This is really important because male butterflies need mud. Male butterflies pass to the female all sorts of salts and minerals with their sperm that caterpillars need in order to grow into a butterfly. Caterpillars do not get all the nutrients they need off of um, what is found just in leaves. They need the salts and minerals that male butterflies drink from mud. But when you think of it, we've paved most of our rivers. Where is there mud anymore for butterflies to drink from? So make a butterfly puddling dish, either just with your own native soil or um, with um, some sand from a nursery, and just keep it slightly damp. And that will really help the male butterflies in your region. Okay, then be sure to plant caterpillar forage and the butterfly nectar plants. Um, this is a gulf fritillary pear, and their caterpillars can only eat this non-native type of non-hybridized passion vine. So I have it in my yard. I have a 60-foot long fence of it because it's what all the birds need, and I have about a dozen bird nests over this little fence of passion vine. They just drop down from the nest, grab a beak full of caterpillars, and go right back up. It's perfect. Then you should allow areas of bare ground with no mulch, because the native ground nesting bees cannot dig through mulch. So in a southeast facing area, a slight slope, leave that uncovered, because that's the kind of aspect that will um, help the bees when they lay their eggs, not have the eggs get cooked in the heat of the tunnels as if it were, when it, if it were facing south. Yeah? Um, you mentioned bare dirt. What about decay? Um, OK, so the question was, what about decomposed granite? Now, when most people have a decomposed granite um, like pathway or like top dressing that's laid down, they mix it with about 10% of, uh, of concrete mix. And that's to make the DG stick. Well, the native bees are not going to be able to dig through that. And so you, you need just regular dirt somewhere southeast facing slope. Then the other place um, that native bees will nest is in the hollow stems of, of um, branches or twigs. Um, so you can make a wood nesting bee apartment by just drilling holes into un untreated blocks of wood. All right, and then leave old stumps and piles of branches somewhere. This will keep a healthy lizard population in your yard. It's habitat for wood nesting bees. 
And then lizards will you know, eat ants, they'll eat flies, great creatures to have around. Then, I cannot stress this enough, leave the leaves. They suppress weeds. They keep water in your soil. And when they decompose, they recycle the nutrients into the soil that help the plants. So what you're basically doing with the fallen leaves is you're mimicking a natural ecosystem. In nature, there wasn't bare ground everywhere, except maybe out in the desert where there are much, there's much less leaf litter because of um, less rainfall. But in all ecosystems, the leaf drop decomposes and goes back in to feed the plant. That's what you want to do in your garden. And then the other important reason for leaving the leaves is that the caterpillars of many species of butterflies, when they go into their chrysalis, they, it's down in the leaf drop below their host plant. So if you make your garden look neat and tidy and you, you know, rake up all the leaves, you're not only going to be using less water, taking the nutrients away from the plant, you are throwing away next year's crop of butterflies because those little chrysalises are in the leaves below the plant. So just leave the leaves. Bare soil is a big no-no, except for the patch for the native ground nesting bees. All right, then um, a further benefit of having mulch with just the leaves of the plant and a layer of mulch is that that provides a layer for different kinds of um, insects to live on, underneath. So towhees, for instance, are ground scratching birds. You've seen them, they kind of hop on the soil and scrape backwards with their feet. Well, they're uncovering the beetles that live underneath the, the leaves. So if you don't have any leaves, you're not gonna have the insect food that these birds are looking for. And then furthermore, plant bunch grasses in your garden. Just a couple of bunches of this grass are incredibly important. This is a nest of a towhee that I found. Um, they couldn't obviously find enough good grass, and he built its nest with tape and embroidery thread, old bandages. So grass, just a couple of bunches, are really important. Then leave the flowers on the plant until the seeds are gone. Then you can deadhead. If you cut off a flower as soon as it starts to um, go brown, you are cutting off the seed, the nut, the fruit, or the berry that that pollinated flower will become. So only deadhead once the seed's been made, whatever, and eaten. Then you can neaten up your plant. Then provide a bird bath, wide, shallow ones for small birds and deep ones for larger birds. OK, now let's get into establishment. All right, the best time to establish a California native garden is in the fall and the winter when it's hopefully raining. Planting any kind of garden, native or non-native, except for tomatoes in spring and summer and other conventional edibles. Planting in the spring and summer is much more tough. The heat's starting and the rain is over. What you want to do is work with nature instead of working against it. So you can plant year round. You can. It's just easier to plant in the fall and the winter and use the spring and the summer for planning your garden, for figuring out the hardscape, making a landscape plan using graph paper. So, um, and if you really must plant in the spring and summer, um, I would only plant clay adapted plants. Clay adapted can grow in both slow draining soil and fast draining soil, but they are going to be more used to having water around their roots when it's hot. Um, so for instance, planting black sage in Indian mallow, white sage, buckwheats, um, 
Caliandra californica, that's the red fairy duster, all those kind of things you can, you can plant in, in spring and summer. I would not plant, for instance, a California lilac in the spring or summer. Just don't do it. Okay. Now, when you plant, when you establish your garden, what you want to do is pretend that you are an El Nino for the entire first year. So you think about how El Ninos happen. They happen with a big amount of rain that deeply soaks the ground, and then it dries out a little bit, and then you get another deep, good rain. That's what you want to do in the way that you water. Never, ever, ever water for a short time and only a tiny amount of water. Because if you do short, shallow <coughs> irrigation, you are going to get horrible root systems on your plants. The roots will be at the surface of the soil. They will not get a good deep root system established. They'll dry out more quickly, and they'll generally be a weak plant. So when you water, always water deeply. And that means for every one gallon plant, you're going to use three to five gallons every time you water that plant. Now this is just for the first year because you're pretending you're an El Nino. Now, when you plant your plant, I hope everybody can hear me. Okay, you want to, this is a side view. What you're going to do is dig a hole that's slightly less deep than the soil in, in the container. So if your soil is this high in the container, you're going to dig a hole that's about a quarter of an inch lower. And that's so that when you plant the plant, the root crown of the plant will be sitting just a little bit higher than the soil level. And that way, when you water, no water will be sitting around the plant stem, because all the water will be here. And then you've made little berms on the side of your moat, and that keeps the water in and the water going down. Okay. Um, so when you are establishing the garden, you dig a hole. Um, well, first of all, you have to know what kind of soil you have, right? To, to choose the right plant, you have to know if you have slow or fast draining soil. So on the getting started with native plants sheet that you all should make sure you take, there is a three-step process of things you need to know, the soil, the sunlight, and your site size. And that tells you how to do a drainage test. You dig a one cubic foot hole, you fill it with water, and you see how long it takes to drain. If it takes about a half an hour or less, you can plant anything. If you have soil that takes longer than that to drain, then you need to plant clay-adapted plants or um, plants that on our website or on the CalScape website say that the plant soil preference is adaptable. So the reason for that is that if you didn't evolve in slow draining soil, you're not going to be able to tolerate having water sitting around your roots. So in California, we've got um, many, many different types of plants that are adapted to clay. You're not going to feel re restricted with a clay palette if you have clay. And clay plants, as I clay adapted plants, can grow in both slow and fast draining soil. Okay, so for decomposed granite kind of slopes, any kind of plant can grow there. But what you want to do is utilize the Theodore Payne Foundation's uh, Plants for Erosion Control Guide. If you go onto the Theodore Payne website under Nursery or Education, and then Plant Guides, you'll see lists of plants for different situations in the garden. 
So for instance, there's a plants for e erosion control and it'll give you the trees, shrubs, and ground covers that evolved on slopes and love living on slopes. So Matillaha poppy, sugar bush, um, yerba, yerba, bon, yerba santa, sorry, uh, thick leafed, I'm having a brain freeze right now, the lavender flowered one, the big one. All right, there are so many plants to choose from. And when you are establishing these plants on the slope, you need to make sure that they get a good deep watering um, just like it, as if they were on a flat expanse. Now, doing that on a slope is a bit more tricky because depending on the, the gradient of the slope, the water will run off more quickly. So let's say you have an oscillating arm sprinkler and you have it going onto the slope and you notice that after five minutes the water starts to run off. What you want to do is only run it for like four and a half minutes, stop it, then maybe a half an hour later start the sprinkler system again and run it for about four and a half minutes. And so the cumulative amount of irrigation that that uh, slope gets will equal three to five gallons per plant over, say, the course of eight four-minute watering. Actually, it'd have to be more. So the way you'd figure this out is, let's say you have um, a drip system on a, on a clay slope. And, and you know that you can only run the water for five minutes before it just starts run, running off the top. And you know that your Netafim drip system puts out about 0.9 of a gallon per hole every um, hour. So if you have this Netafim system, oops, so if, can everybody hear me? Okay, I'm going to. So if you have a Netafim system that's spaced about a foot apart and it's going like this across your slope and you've got, you know, holes every foot like that, you, you know that you're going to get really good penetration of the soil with water after about one hour because the each, each hole is, is, is putting out about one gallon per hour. And then the system is just like a, a grid about a foot apart, you know, like a very loose weave. And so if your slope is such that you can only run it for five minutes, you know, you might have to do it 12 times. And, and set, so set your timers to go off for just five minutes, 12 times on, on your slope, because that's how you're, you're going to get the good deep root system established. If you have a decomposed granite slope, um, depending on the steepness of the slope, on DG the water will soak in more quickly. So you could, in theory, run it longer, run your sprinkler system longer um, than uh, if it were clay, but it just depends upon the, on, on the slope. Okay, any other questions regarding that? Yeah. Yeah, the soil type will vary a lot, usually, over a piece of land that's as big as an acre. But soil type can vary a lot, even just on a small piece of land, because you never know with California's landscape history of how much things were twisted or overlaid. So I would do several soil tests in several different places. I live on an alluvial fan, and it's fast draining everywhere I go on, on the property, which isn't very big, just because it's an alluvial fan. Um, but if it's in the flats, your, your soil type can, can vary much more. OK, um, so just to recap, when you plant your plant, you always want to dig your hole three times as wide, slightly less deep than the soil in the container, and then you want to soak your hole three or four times, letting the water completely 
go into the hole and drain into the soil. And that way, once all the water has drained out and you plant your plant, the roots are going to follow that water down into the soil. That's what you're doing. You're creating like this little breadcrumb trail for the roots to go down, 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 down and make a really healthy plant. Then um, once you've planted the plant and gently patted the uh, soil around the, the roots and made your berm, then you're going to deeply water it again. And the way you know how often your plant needs water is based on the kind of soil you have. So with fast draining granitic types of soil, you'll need to water more frequently. For me, that ended up being watering about once a week during the first year. Um, if it were really, really hot, I would water in advance of the heat. When it is blistering hot out, you do not want to water your native plants. Because what that does is it creates a perfect environment for fungus to grow. Heat and water feeds fungus. So the best thing you can do is water in advance of a heat wave when it's less than 85 Fahrenheit out. You know, so if you know, oh, next week's going to be horribly hot, water now and then stop. And then wait until the heat wave is over for watering the plant once again. Um, people that I know that have slow draining soil, that have clay, and they're establishing their gardens, they might water only once every 10 days to two weeks for the first year because the water and nutrients, well, because the water stays in the soil so much um, lo longer. And so basic rule of thumb for me with fast draining soil was that I watered once a week deeply during the first year. I watered once every two weeks deeply during the second year and once every three weeks um, from, from then on. Now my garden survives on being watered about once every three to four weeks if it's not raining. All right, um, any questions on watering, establishment? You mean for if you had a slope with the with the, the oyas in it? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, any type of a bush type plant. Um, yeah, but you need um, you'd need to have a lot of oyas up there because because basically, does everyone know what an an, an oya is? Okay, an, an oya is an ancient method that a lot of uh, the indigenous peoples used for farming in the southwest. They're clay pots um, about this big with a neck, and people would um, embed them in the ground, you know, with the neck up slightly higher than soil level so they can see where they are, and then they'd fill them with water. And then the idea is, is that the water from the oya soaks into the ground slowly, um, re releasing the, the water over a long period of time so that the plant has what, it's need what it needs. If you did an oya, oyas on the slope, what you would want is to have an even distribution of, of oyas everywhere in the same way that you had you know, your netafim drip lines every foot apart making a nice kind of grid. Um, and you would need to do that because the big mistake um, or the uh, very uh, unhelpful thing of the way drip systems used to be made uh, happens with oyas. If you only have an oya like ring around the plant, it might work now while the plant is growing and is a baby. But let's say you plant a sugar bush that wants to be 10 feet wide on your slope. And so if you had oyas around it now to put the water out to where that baby one gallon plant is, you would need to go and keep installing more oyas on the slope as the plant gets bigger and the root systems really go farther out. And so, you know, if you're planting a, a slope or any area where um, 
it's going to be pretty much a complete coverage of um, the crowns of the plants coming up and almost touching each other. It's, you, you need complete coverage because from irrigation lines or spray because the root systems go at least as wide as the drip line of a plant and sometimes half again farther. And if you keep the water concentrated just at the, at the root, at the drip line when the plant was a baby, the roots aren't going to go farther out and you will not get a well-established plant. Okay, any other questions on establishment? Okay, um, let's just talk about irrigation methods. Um, both drip and overhead uh, work with native plants. Um, the biggest mistake I see with, with overhead is that um, people are using them uh, at the wrong times and they'll, like, like, they'll have them go on when it's really hot out and then the water sits on the leaves and then fungus grows on, on the leaves and attacks the plants. So you need to you know, sort of monitor when that overhead spray is going to come on. Um, with the old kinds of spaghetti line drip systems, the um, drip lines would be put out that were great for when the plant was little. But then as the plant grew, the water stayed here, but the root tips were five feet out that way. And then people are surprised when the plant dies. You need to make sure you have the water where the roots are to take it in. Any questions? Yeah. We have hard water, and I've been using drip for many years, and it's the preferred method, method I understand. But the black drippers get clogged up, and I don't know what to do because they stop working. And I have so much space. <coughs> Right. Right. So, so in that, so the new Netafim, if you're about to put in uh, drip, that has um, filters so that the minerals in the water won't won't clog the drip system. So Netafim lines are are one inch lines, and um, I have a lot of minerals in my water and haven't had any problems yet but I'll, I'll, I'll let you know in 10 years. And so, so if you're replacing or needing to transition to something else because you can't ferret out where all the old lines are, um, I would get the, the, you know, either put your sprinklers up on risers so that they're up because a lot of times people will have a sprinkler in a place where it's blocked by a plant and then the rest of the garden doesn't get any, any water in that area. So position your overheads so that they can get a full reach and um, make sure that your overhead comes on at, at night when it's cool or in the early morning hours so that you're not watering during the heat of the day. Net, Netafim, N-E-T-A-F-I-M. Um, I, I believe so, but uh, Western Municipal should have lots of information on it. And, there, and there's, there are other types that are just as good as that. And um, all sorts of um, different systems like M MP rotators with big drops so that it's less prone to e evaporation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why did you say uh, water at night when I've been told that plants don't take up water at night? Well, if you water at night, um, the water soaks into the soil and less will be evaporated by the heat of the sun. So you actually get more water soaking in and not being evaporated off because it's, it's hot out. And then... and then be available for the plants during the day? Yeah. I mean, it's all down in the ground. Yeah. Okay, so some of you had questions about propagating native plants. Um, there is a book by Dara Emery, uh, I think it's E-M-M-O-R-Y, about propagating California native plants from seed. 
That is an excellent book, and it tells you which ones need to be treated in some way and which don't. Um, then, if you want to uh, propagate plants, certain ones do much better being where you get a higher rate of success with propagating from vegetative types of cuttings. Um, Rancho Santa Ana, the Theodore Payne Foundation, there are many places to take classes in how to propagate native plants by vegetative cuttings and by seed. Um, knowing how to do this is a wonderful thing that you can do for your community. If any of you work with schools, getting native plants into schools is a wonderful way to have a ripple effect of native plants getting into the larger surrounding community. Because if you plant um, native plants like elderberry, toyon, native fuchsia, um, red fairy duster, um, in Indian mallow, all these plants self-sow prolifically by seed. And you can teach you know, the kids or the teachers how to uh, you know, uh, grow these plants, and then you can dig up the volunteers and spread them into the community. Um, this, is, this is what needs to happen, and we need to, need, need to use our libraries, our schools, and other public spaces for native plant landscapes that demonstrate the beauty, water savings, and support of the ecosystem for the public. Because not enough people know that this is the way we need to do things for the next 100 years and onwards. We've transitioned, or we're trying to transition, from the use of fossil fuels to solar and wind. We need to transition from ornamental, non-native plants in our landscapes to native. This is the new green, or the potential new green economy. Instead of all of these ornamental nurseries, that proliferate, those should be native plant nurseries. If you know young people coming up who are saying, I want to help the planet, I don't know what to do, it's, you know, it's such a big problem what we're doing to the planet. Well, a way that everyone can help is by planting a native garden or by starting a native plant nursery or becoming a landscape architect that knows how to put in native gardens. If any of you out here love gardening and think you might want to do this or learn how to do it, you will find no shortage of work. Because at the foundation, we have a waiting list of people um, on all the landscapers whose names we have recommended that know how to put in native gardens. So seriously, talk to your families, talk to your friends, talk to your com communities, your churches, your mosques. At, at your temple and talk to people about native plants and about making the transformation start in your local community because that is what it's going to take. And when we do that, we inspire people and they see that, yeah, there are a lot of big problems in the world, but there's so much you can do right here, right now. All right. So. All right, so any, any other questions? All right. Mm -hmm. Nurse Rock. Oh, thank you. All right, so a really important thing for doing with um, gardening in a hot place is put a big rock, at least a foot by foot, on the south facing side or the southwest facing side of your new plant. Because what that nurse rock does is it shades the roots and it helps hold the moisture in the soil. Um, and the bigger rock that you can find, the better. Um, nurse rocks are, are really great for gardening in tough places. If, if you're on a slope, put a rock, in, embed a, a boulder into the soil at at least one quarter of the boulder's height on the um, downslope side of the plant and put several. And that will help hold the moisture in, shore up the slope, and shade the roots and keep the water in, in the soil. 
Uh, there are many places that you can go to get boulders. Um, I know that if you uh, contact the Angeles National Forest at the Arcadia Station, and maybe there are places like that out here, you can buy a permit for about $10 and take away as many one cubic foot boulders or smaller as you want over a 10 day period. So, you know, that is one way to do it if you're on a limited budget. All right, any, any other questions? Yeah. Um, the Angeles National Forest um, has one. Their headquarters is in Arcadia, but I'm sure here, like for the, uh, for the Cleveland National Forest or other more local agencies, I mean, you've got some big riverbeds here. You could just call them and find out about getting a, a permit. Otherwise, you can buy rocks, and they're usually about 11 to 13 cents a pound for granite rocks. Um, but then make sure you ask them if they will bring them to your house. <laughs> Excellent. So Cleveland National Forest has an office in Corona. So call them. All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here. You've been a great audience. And best of luck with your gardening. <laughs>